when you blow up the balloon, the dimes all get further apart from each other. And, and a dime that's further apart from you originally is moving away from you faster as the balloon expands. So uh, it was a curve like this that Hubble looked at and said the universe is expanding. But now we're sufficiently sophisticated that we're looking for some curvature in this, in this plot. And they expected to find that following a curve like this, showing that the universe was decelerating with time, gravity pulls everything together. So if the universe is expanding, the galaxies are all attracting each other, you expect the acceleration of the universe to be decelerating. You expect it to be slowing down slightly with time. And if the data were over here, that's what they were looking for. But they found it over here. They found that it was actually on the other side of this, this uh, straight line. And so actually, the, the universe was accelerating with time. Those, those, those uh, supernova were too faint. It meant that the universe had been stretching more in recent times. They were too far away. And so it meant that the universe is a, the expansion of the universe was accelerating. Now, what could, what, what could cause this? So now I'm going to show, now don't be scared. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to show, I just want, we're just going to look at these equations. We're not going to work them. We're just going to look at them, like from a distance, you know. Um, but I'm showing it to you because this equation up here, Einstein, we got to ask Einstein for what could be causing this. This is his field equations of general relativity. This is one of the most important discoveries of the 20th century. Einstein came up with the idea that the thing that caused gravity wasn't forces pulling on each other like Newton thought, uh, like strings between things pulling together. No, no, it was due to the curvature of space and time. And, and so these are equations that tell that he worked on for seven years to tell him how this would work. And so this is the stuff in the universe. This is this is the stuff in the universe here, and it causes space and time to curve. These are curvature terms, and it tells you how much curvature is produced by the stuff. So the, this was tested. Um, Einstein was able to explain the perihelion advance in the orbit of Mercury that Newton couldn't explain, and he predicted ahead of time that light would be bent traveling in the curved space-time around the sun slightly, by the gravitational field of the sun, and this could be measured during a solar eclipse, and it was in 1919, and Einstein was right and Newton was wrong. So these equations, this is a picture of Einstein beating Newton. Newton is not an easy man to beat. <laughs> He's got the theory of gravity, it's his most famous thing, and Einstein comes along, steals the ball, and puts it in the basket. This is the greatest play of science maybe in the 20th century. Um, and so what is this stuff here? Einstein showed that not only, uh, this had several terms. There's 16 components for this thing, this stuff. Uh, and and uh, the, the, the time, the, there are four dimensions of space here and four, four dimensions of space time here. So the, this has one component that's the density of material. Well, that's not surprising, the dense stuff. The Earth is dense, so it produces some curvature of space-time, and that causes things to be attracted toward it. Um, but Einstein, all, this has other components, pressure in the x, y, and z directions in particular. And so Einstein's equations showed that pressure gravitates as well as energy density. Newton wouldn't have figured this. Newton, this is something Newton wouldn't have anticipated. So you're... you're you're slightly gravitationally attracted toward the air in your tires because it has some density in there, but also the pressure in your tires is actually pulling you slightly over towards your tires. It's a very small effect, but it's an additional effect. So this was something that Einstein uh, said that Newton wouldn't have anticipated. He did this in 1915. It moved him up into the category of Isaac Newton. And in 1917, Einstein decided to apply these field equations to cosmology. He applied them in the solar system. And there was one trouble with these field equations. They didn't produce a static universe model. They had no solution that was static. 
And yet Einstein thought that the, the stars, by then, all people knew about was stars and our own galaxy. And they looked like they were going around with very slow velocities and random speeds. And it didn't look like the universe was expanding or contracting or anything. The universe looked static. So Einstein said, I, I need a static universe model to agree with the observations. And so he added a term to these field equations over here. He added an extra term that would allow him to produce a static model. This was called the cosmological constant. This thing in here, is this lambda term, is a constant term. He added a term to his field equations. These field equations had the remarkable property that they implied local energy conservation, which is a very good thing to have. And interestingly, this term is the only other term that you could add to these field equations that would preserve that quality. And so uh, it's something that really Einstein only could have invented. Um, what he's saying here is that the laws of gravity are not what you think they are. Um, this equations had the very interesting property that if there was no stuff at all, if you had a vacuum here, and you had flat space-time, this curvature was zero, this curvature was zero, zero equals zero. Flat space-time with no curvature at all was a solution to this field equations when there was no stuff. But that was no longer true here. And so this term is going to be gravitationally repulsive and it's going to balance the attraction of the mass for, for the other mass in his field equations is going to allow him to have a static universe model. That's why he introduced this cosmological constant term. Now, in about, this was in 1917. In about 1927-ish, by that time, Mr. Lamatra figured out that, you know, you could take this term over here and you could move it to the other side of the equation and add it over here, put it over here with the minus sign and put it with the stuff. And so you could, you could say, I've got, here's my normal stuff and here's this extra stuff over here, which is an energy and uh, pressure that the vacuum would have, that empty space would have. And so, um, if you got no normal particles here, th there's going to still be an energy in the vacuum, okay? And so, um, if you solve this, if you want, what does this extra term look like? The energy and stuff in the vacuum is going to look like this term, a minus with this term here. Let's just look again at what this term looks like. This is called the metric here, and uh, it has... It has this form. It has a minus one up here and plus one, plus one, plus one. This is how distances are measured between nearby events in space-time. And here's the normal spatial coordinates, x, y, and z. These are the three dimensions of space. And this is time. And Einstein showed that you had to have a minus sign on this time dimension, that time could be viewed as a dimension really a fourth dimension, uh, if you put a minus sign on it, and this guaranteed that light would uh, be seen to be the same constant speed by all observers, and all observers could agree on this. So this, this, this thing here, mathematical thing here, had a minus one, a plus one, and a plus one, and a plus one in it. And when you pulled it over here, when you pulled it over here, you put a minus sign with it, and that meant that the the, the density in the vacuum, which was this term over here, it meant that it was positive. And it meant that the pressure in the vacuum was negative in all three directions, in the x direction, the y direction, and the z direction. So if you think about the vacuum, empty space, usually you think, well, there's nothing there. It has zero density. So if you take out all the particles, you take out all the photons, you take out everything, leave completely empty space, you think it's going to be zero density. But no, if this is true, the vacuum itself has a non-zero density that you can measure. And it has a negative pressure. And this density is constant all over, everywhere in space and time. And so this pressure, this negative pressure is uniform all over. It's kind of like a universal suction. 
but it doesn't have any dynamical effect because it's constant everywhere. If you, you're sitting in this room, the pressure in this room is about 15 pounds per square inch, but you don't notice it because it's uniform. If a cold front blows in, you got a high pressure area here and a low pressure area over here, the wind will blow and you can be blown off your feet. But if the pressure is uniform, you don't, you don't notice it. So this is the case here. We don't notice the hydrodynamical effects of this uh, vacuum pressure, but we do notice the gravitational effects. And since this pressure is negative, it means it has a negative gravitational effect. It means it has a repulsive gravitational effect. So if you got some of this vacuum energy density, and this is what we're, this is dark energy. This is dark energy, vacuum energy. You'll have a constant energy density here and a negative pressure in the three different directions. So this vacuum energy, oh yeah, that's attractive. That tends to pull things together. But this negative pressure here operates in three directions and it's repulsive and since it beats it three times to one, three times as strong the repulsion as the attraction. So overall, this vacuum energy in empty space has a repulsive gravitational effect. And this can balance the gravitational attraction of all the stars for each other and allow Einstein to have his static uh, universe uh, model. And so that's, that's what Einstein was doing. And, and this model in space-time looked like this. I'm showing one dimension of space and one dimension of time. This is a circular cross-section here. It's actually like a higher dimensional sphere, but we're like ants going around on the surface of this, and time is going this way. These would be the world lines of the galaxies. They're just going straight up here from the past to the present. The radius of this universe, it's closed universe. You, you, it's, you keep going around left, and you could circle the universe and come back to the Earth. You keep going that way, you circle, get back to the Earth. But the, 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 it's not getting any bigger and it's not getting any smaller, it's static. That's the Einstein static universe, and it's a solution to his equations. But then, in 1924, 22 to 24, Mr. Friedman, who was a mathematician working in Russia, said, listen, forget that. I'm going to throw away that cosmological constant term. I'm going to use the original Einstein equations. You can't make a static model? Fine. I'll solve it and find out what dynamics it has. Oh, I'll, I'll find out what it's doing. And he got this model, which is a Big Bang model. And this model looks like this. I brought a visual aid here. It looks like a football. It's a football shape in space time. So time is going this way. This is one dimension of space that goes around here. It's a closed universe, just like Einstein had, but it starts off at zero size at the bottom, at a big bang. And it, it, it explodes, it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger, until finally it reaches the maximum size, and then starts collapsing, and it ends up in a big crunch, singularity at the end. You do not want to be around at the big crunch. <laughs> the volume of the universe goes to zero. It's very cramped. <laughs> you get crushed at the end, okay? But, but this is a model for the universe, and the galaxy's world lines are like, the only thing real here, I should say, is the, is the pig skin itself. It's a two-dimensional surface here that we're showing. And this is the world lines of the galaxies. Here's one. Look, it's going perfectly straight, just like Einstein would have wanted. And, and yet, the curvature of space is bending them back together. So it looks like they're gravitationally attracting each other, and the galaxies are pulling back together. This is how Einstein's field equations are supposed to work without a fudge factor in them. <laughs> Gravity is attractive, so if it starts off with an explosion, it's going to turn, and, and turn back around. Friedman published this model in 1922, 1924, and nobody paid much attention to them. And Einstein said, well, that's a nice mathematical model, but, you know, I think my model's bad, right, because, you know, the universe is static, of course, so my model would be the applicable one. But then, 
In about 1929, Hubble discovers the expansion of the universe. He sees other galaxies are moving away from us, and the further away, they're moving faster. He, Hubble is finding, by 1931, galaxies moving away from us at 20,000 kilometers a second. This is a reasonable fraction of the speed of light, which is 300,000 kilometers a second. Hubble is finding an expanding universe. And so at this point, uh, Einstein tells uh, George Gamow, you know, <laughs> that cosmological constant, that's the biggest blunder I've made in my life. And, and why would he say that? Because if he hadn't have discovered this cosmological constant, if he, hadn't have, if he just hadn't have thought of this, and he'd done Friedman's paper instead, he would have predicted that the universe had to be either expanding or contracting. And then when Hubble discovered the expanding universe, everybody would have said, oh my God, they would have carried Einstein through the, through the street on a chair, you know. He'd have been a hero, you know. I mean, this is much more spectacular confirmation of his theory then the expansion of the whole universe? I mean, Newton wouldn't have thought of such a thing. This would be a much bigger confirmation of his theory than mere light bending around the sun, which they checked. So, uh, um, of course, he felt bad that he even invented the thing because no one else would have thought of it. <laughs> so so that's, uh, that's what he told uh, George Gamow. But after, of course, Hubble, we, we, we trace back, and there's this Big Bang singularity at the beginning. There's a, there's a Big Bang. And George Gamow says, you know, back at the, if that's really, if we trace back the expansion of the universe, we're sitting here, it's expanding, we should trace back and it should be a hot Big Bang, because if things were crammed together then, it was very hot. And we should see this thermal radiation today. And he and his students, Herman and Alpha, predicted it should be about five degrees um, above absolute zero, and it should be microwave radiation coming to us from all sides. And the COBE satellite measured this very accurately, this spectrum of this, and it's perfectly thermal, just like uh, there's the theoretical prediction that uh, uh, Gamow would have made. And so the, uh, this radiation was discovered by friends of mine, Arno Penzias and Bob Wilson in 1965. They won the Nobel Prize for discovering this radiation. It was very accurately shown to be thermal, vindicating um, Gamow's, um, Gamow's, uh, uh, Gamow's concept. So we know we have this hot uh, Big Bang. Now, these are cosmological models. This is the amount of matter in the universe, the amount of these black marbles here and the, the black plus the white marbles here. And this is the amount of vacuum energy that we have in the cosmological constant. And so this, uh, a point on this diagram is a cosmological model. There's one with 40% with um, uh, you know, dark energy and 40% uh, dark matter. Um, it, it, this stippled line here is data from the cosmic microwave background, which shows that the universe is flat. It's along this line. The, the closed models, like Friedman had, <laughs> the closed models, I didn't hit it, I just knocked it off. Um, uh, these, these are, uh, these are the uh, measurements of the cosmic microwave background, show you have to be somewhere in this region. And these green dots here are from the supernova. They're showing the universe is accelerating. It means you have to have a cosmological constant. It means you have to have some vacuum energy density because that would be what would cause the accelerated expansion of the universe. And then these two intersect over here where you got about 70% uh, uh, dark energy and about 30% dark matter. So this is the basis on which we, um, the 30% the dark and normal matter. So this is the total amount of matter uh, in the universe. Um, here's a picture of the same graph. And these individual lines on here, this is a paper I worked on, um, these, are, these are the lines, these, this, these are the set of points where an individual supernova in the Harvard data was exactly the right brightness. So up here was to, to uh, if, you're, if you're here, 
uh, this one would be too bright, and, and, and uh, if you're over here, this one would be too faint. So here would be the places where this particular supernova was exactly the right brightness. And so um, uh, uh, if you're over here, I mean, all of them are too bright. And, and that's not likely. It's like you're throwing up coins. If you throw up 16 coins, you're likely to get half of them heads, half of them tails. It's very improbable to get all of them, all of them heads. So you're very unlikely to be over here. And so if we colored all this in according to the probabilities, we find that it's quite likely that you're in this region here, which is exactly where the supernova people had said they were. We're just looking at their data in a bit different way. Um, we're, we're, we're basically looking at the median statistics here. We're saying, um, we're, we're confirming that they have an accelerated universe because we're saying more than half their, their supernova were, were too faint given the standard model. So this is the evidence that we have for the accelerating um, universe. Now when they discovered this in 1997, Science did an article on it in the magazine and they put, they put Einstein on the cover. <laughs> because this is the ultimate vindication for him. There really is a cosmological constant term that's needed. So that was not a blunder after all. So they show him blowing bubbles and accelerating the expansion of the universe here. And so this is, uh, this is the, uh, where they made the announcement of this uh, important uh, discovery. Excuse me. Um, now people were ready for this idea that the universe might have a vacuum energy density because in the previous years, in 1980, starting 1981, people started to think about this for the beginning of the universe. Um, the problem was that the standard Big Bang model here was very uniform. It was the same temperature over here as it was over here. Yet these two things really didn't have time to communicate with each other with light beams. The universe was expanding so fast here that light couldn't cross back and forth in time to get them in causal contact with each other. So, so if we're looking over here and we're looking, we're here, we're looking back in time over here, back in time over here, we're seeing these two regions, they're at the same temperature. How did they get at the same temperature? And so Alan Goose suggested that we needed to add a little period of hyperexpansion at the beginning of the universe, which he called inflation, which would give a little bit of extra time here for these to get in causal contact with each other. And this was a period where the universe's expansion was accelerating, not decelerating, and it was a period characterized by a very high vacuum energy density and a very high negative pressure. And so Guth thought that this might be true because in the early universe, the laws of physics were different than they were here. The, 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 the strengths of the different forces were different in the very early universe at very high energy, very early in the universe. And so there was this period where the universe would double and double and double in size every 10 to the minus 38 seconds, we, we think now. And so this would, the universe would go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, 64, uh, bigger and bigger, and it would become enormous and it put these regions into causal contact. So Goose's idea was that the universe was originally had a very high vacuum energy density. This is like living in a mountain valley very high above sea level. There was a very high energy density in the early universe, a very high negative pressure. And it would have sat there forever and expanded but according to quantum mechanics, there's always a chance you'll tunnel out of this mountain valley and then you can roll down to sea level. Because we know the vacuum energy density is, is low today. And so Guth figured that it would, it would tunnel through here and then, and then this would make a model that would roll down to sea level. So early in the universe, very high vacuum energy density, very high value of the cosmological constant, if you will, and a very low value today. That's why you want to put this stuff over there with the stuff instead of over there with the laws of gravity. Because if they're over there on the laws of gravity side, they shouldn't change with the early universe. That lambda term should always be a constant. But here it's variable. It can be low now, but high in the early universe. 
And so the vacuum energy could be high early and then fall down into be the lower area today. So this is the sort of picture that we have today. This is a model that I proposed in 1982 that you had this accelerated expansion. This is a vacuum energy. State is expanding very fast and bubbles form and it rolls down the hill. When it's in the bubble, it rolls down the hill. We're one of the bubble universes. You make an infinite number of these bubble universes. And uh, this same scenario, I talked about the geometry of this from general relativity point of view, but Andre Linde and Albrecht and Steinhardt a few months later had a detailed particle uh, physics uh, scenario, which actually produced exactly this uh, geometry. They were working independently. And so this is our inflationary universe. The thing that started the Big Bang, the, the thing that gets everything expanding at the beginning of the universe is the negative gravitational effect of this negative pressure of the quantum vacuum state in the early universe, the very high energy quantum vacuum state in the early universe. So this can make for you a multiverse today with many bubble universes that are, that are forming. And, and, the, and this is, looks like it's going to expand forever, unlike the uh, uh, Friedman model. So what evidence do we have for this inflation? Well, if we look at the cosmic microwave background, here's the cosmic microwave background. This is a color scheme that um, uh, Wes Colley and I invented. The, the hot spots are in red, the cold spots are in blue, and these are small fluctuations of one part in 100,000 in the temperature of the microwave background as we look across the sky. This is a whole sky map of the cosmic microwave background. And you'll notice that it, these are supposed to be in inflation, random quantum fluctuations, because the universe is tiny at this point when this, uh, these fluctuations were made. And, and so the number of hot and cold spots ought to be similar. And in fact, you can look at this picture and see they are. This ought to be symmetric with respect to hot and cold spots. And so that's one of the tests of inflation. And so we tested this. These are, this is a statistic that counts the number of hot spots. If you go up to a temperature above average, like in the red here, you'll see hot spots. And then if you go really way red, then there are fewer of them. Uh, and then there's, there's cold spots down here. And this is the observational data here, the 95% confidence level for the observational data. And there's the theory curve through it. So it fits perfectly. So it shows that these fluctuations are indeed uh, random fluctuations just like you'd expect from inflation to produce. And here's the power in these fluctuations as a function of angular scale. And this is one degree. There's a peak here. This is where most of the spots are that you see. And then these are, these are sound waves in the early universe. And the thing I want to point out here is that the red points here are the data. And the green curve going through here is the theory based on inflation. So all these wiggles and twists and turns in this are predicted by this theory of inflation. It's really remarkably impressive. This is from the Planck satellite um, uh, just this year. And so this angular scale here is what tells us the universe is flat. And these sizes of these peaks down here allows us to measure the amount of, uh, of, of dark energy versus uh, dark matter that's present. And, and all this fits together. The, the, the general shape of this is also fit by a, a tilt function, which is predicted by inflation. So this is an amazing prediction by inflation fitting with the data. This is one of the reasons that we believe um, inflation. Now recently this year, they detected a group led by John Kovac at Harvard uh, found observing at the South Pole in the microwaves, observing the polarization of the microwave background uh, for three years they had to observe. This is many uh, seasons overnight, you know, in the South Pole. This is uh, three years of observations. They found a swirling pattern in these. This is, this is going uh, clockwise, this is going counterclockwise. Uh, swirls 
in the polarization pattern that are characteristic that would be produced by gravity waves in the early universe. This was predicted by inflation. They went looking for this and they have found this. And if this is confirmed, there's several groups. This is a very difficult observation. So people always have to say, well, we have to see if it's confirmed by other groups. But there's a satellite, the Planck satellite, that can potentially uh, confirm this. This is a really important discovery because inflation predicts these gravity waves because the universe was so tiny originally. And the amount of this effect is telling us how quickly the universe was doubling in size. And the answer is about once it was doubling in size every 10 to the minus 38 seconds. Uh, so we go 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. It was a very fast expansion at the beginning. And this is really, as many people including me would say, if this, if this holds up, this is really the smoking gun that shows you that you had an epoch of very high vacuum energy density in the early universe um, as inflation. And in fact, Time Magazine came out today. They have their issue where they pick the 100 most influential people in the world. And in here is John Kovac, who is the Harvard astronomer who led this uh, group. So there's, there's one astronomer on this list, I'm happy to say. <laughs> one of the 100 people is an astronomer. And um, this is the most exciting thing going on in astronomy today, that we may have a really smoking gun showing us that inflation is true in the, in the early universe. And inflation is really a high energy form of dark energy. So let me talk now about today. What do we think the dark energy is today? The standard picture is that there's some, we're sitting in a mountain valley, but it's not, it's a, it's, I would call it a lowland valley here, slightly above sea level, and there's a slight energy density in the vacuum today. This is what's causing the acceleration and the expansion of the universe today, vacuum energy density. How much is it? Well, about 10 to the minus 31 grams per cubic centimeter. That's how pathetic it is. But it, it doesn't affect the solar system things. That's why we don't notice it. But it does affect the expansion of the universe. It's causing the universe today to be starting to double in size about every, once every 10 billion years. So this is a very low energy form of inflation. And if we're sitting at the bottom of one of these valleys, um, and uh, it should give us just an energy density, it should look like the cosmological, it should look like a cosmological constant. And the string theorists tell us there may be many valleys in a landscape, which depends on various fields that are in the universe, and that we're just sitting in one of these valleys. And this is so close to zero, because if it were much higher, um, then uh, the universe would have started its accelerated expansion long ago, and you would have never made galaxies, would have never made stars, it would have had a runaway expansion too early, and so we intelligent creatures wouldn't have been here. Well, that's, that's an uninhabitable universe, so we don't find ourselves on an uninhabitable universe. We find ourselves in one of the many uh, universes that, that, that have a, a sufficiently low value of this for intelligent life to develop. Now, Linde, let's go back to inflation. Linde had a picture, a simple picture of what he calls chaotic inflation, where you were rolling down a hill. And so, in fact, uh, the, there is evidence from the microwave background that we're slowly rolling down a hill by the, by the shape of that spectrum. It means that the vacuum energy density was declining with time. That's a that's a, that's a vacuum energy density that's decreasing with time. And we're rolling down the hill here. And this is what Linde predicted in about 1983. And, and so it's slowly rolling down. And this had predictions that it made, which have been uh, confirmed. So in inflation, we were slowly rolling down a hill, not sitting at the bottom of a valley. If we were sitting at the bottom of a valley, we'd still be sitting there today, and we wouldn't have the low energy universe that we have today. So inflation looks like the part we're seeing, the end of inflation looks like you're rolling down a hill. So 
I wrote a paper with Zach Slepian where we said our hypothesis was that dark energy that we're seeing today is really just a second epoch of low energy inflation, just like the first one, only it's occurring at low energy. And so we had a simple potential. This is, this is what, this part of it here is what Mr. Linde said. He said, it's just a hill. It's a quadratic hill like this. It's like the bottom of a parabola here. And this, the value of the energy density in the vacuum depends on this value of this phi. And there's this, uh, this is what we call a massive scalar field. And this mass is associated with a particle that's about uh, 10 to the minus 5 in terms of Planck units, which are about 10 to the minus 5 grams. So these are, this course, oscillations in this field co correspond to particles with a mass of about 10 to the minus 10 grams, which is very heavy, much heavier than a proton, which is about maybe 10 to the minus 24 grams. Um, and we're proposing that there's just a second uh, field here, this very low energy, very low mass fields that produce this uh, 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 cosmological constant that we're seeing today. And so if inflation was just rolling down this hill, which is consistent with with uh, what we're seeing in, in the microwave background, then we could be low, rolling down a hill also today. And there's other people that have talked about this kind of model and with many fields and things, but it gives basically the same result. So we're not alone in this. Um, this is a picture of the tilt of that fluctuation spectrum. And this is, a, this is the, the amount of gravity waves that we're seeing in the early universe. This is a picture before the Harvard group uh, made its observations. And this point right here is Mr. Linde's prediction with this simple formula for what, how, the, uh, dar how the dark energy in the early universe would behave. It predicted a value of this ratio r of 0.13 and uh, it predicted this value of this tilt. And this red line here shows that they were measuring this tilt to be quite accurately equal to what Lindy had said. When the Harvard group came in, they measured the, the gravity waves in the early universe and came out with a value here. And the uncertainty in it brings it down to about here. So right now we would draw these contour levels right around this. So, so this model where you have a simple parabolic valley uh, that you're rolling into by Linde is fitting with all the observation and perhaps it did it predicted a high value here and and people weren't thinking we were going to see this but actually the, the the group came in with numbers just about this so when when they got their results they went over to Linde's house with a bottle of champagne and they said we found r equal 0.2 <laughs> he says 0.2 <laughs> Really? A bit high, but okay. <laughs> it's great. This is basically what he predicted in 1983. It's a tremendous uh, 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 victory for Mr. Linde that he got this number right to within a factor of two. And so um, uh, inflation of rolling down a hill is looking good. Um, today, we're trying to measure this quantity. This is the ratio of the pressure to the energy density in the dark energy. And we're trying to measure this by following the dynamics of the universe and seeing how, just how it's accelerating over time. And remember, if it's a simple cosmological constant, P is equal to minus rho. So W is equal to exactly minus one. So if we find little w is exactly equal to minus one, that means we're sitting at the bottom of one of these valleys and, and, and then we have the simple model where it looks like a cosmological constant. Um, these people said, well, let's see, maybe it's varying in time. So we'll invent this formula where, where A is the expansion factor in the universe, and A at zero is the Big Bang, and A equal one is now. And we'll, we'll assume that this W has a current value here, and plus it's been varying in time with this component, and we're going to solve for these things and see what kind of limits we can get on them. And this is the answers that we've gotten so far. Um, w naught, that's the current value of W. Here's minus 1. This is what we expect to find. 
there it is, and here's zero. That means it's not varying in time either. So this point right here is Einstein's point. That's the cosmological constant, a perfect cosmological constant. Little w is equal to minus one. It's a va nothing but vacuum energy density. And you can see the error bars in the observations are fit right around this. So it's an amazing vindication for Einstein that it's so close to this that, that he would have, uh, that he would have uh, uh, predicted. Now, this is what little w is doing if you're rolling down a hill. If you're rolling, this is the vacuum energy density here. This is the vacuum pressure. This is minus one. If it's not rolling at all, if this value of phi is not changing with time, that's the derivative of this with respect to time. If this is not changing, these terms are zero. You're sitting at the bottom of the hill. W is equal to minus V over plus V. It's minus one. But if it's rolling down a hill, this term is positive. This term is positive. And so it makes little w slightly less, uh, slightly more positive than negative one. And so you could measure this in principle. You could measure the difference between w and the canonical value of minus one. And this is proportional to this value of the, of the rolling down the hill. Um, this is equations for this. Again, I'm not going to explain these, but I'll just say that when, you, when you're rolling down a hill, there, it's, like you're rolling, it's like you're falling in a parachute. There's a, there's a frictional term due to the expansion of the universe that's sapping your, your kinetic energy. And uh, you're, you're falling. There's a force pulling you down the hill, which is this. And here's the acceleration that you have. Well, if you fall down a hill with a frictional force, what happens to you is that you quickly reach a terminal velocity. Any parachute person could tell you that. You reach a terminal velocity, in which case uh, the acceleration stops and you have this terminal velocity here. And you, the difference from W uh, and minus one should fall off like one over the square of this frictional force, which is the, the rate at which the universe is expanding at that time. So the, um, let's go to this curve. Um, this is the amount of the difference between uh, uh, W and minus one. And this is following the equations of rolling down the hill. This is this approximate formula. So we've got an approximate formula throughout W would change with time. And here's where quasars are at redshift to two uh, in the past. And, and so we can measure how this is departing and we can actually look for this. So if we discovered that W was changing with time and that it was slightly different from minus one, we would learn something new about dark Linde found from inflation. So that would be a very important discovery. So uh, it gives people something to look for. The alternative is you, you, you see W is equal to minus one and you're not rolling down the hill and then it's constant and then that's like what Einstein would have proposed. And so we have a formula. Now how we can look for this by looking for baryon acoustic oscillations uh, when there's a splash of matter here where there's a galaxy, there's sound waves sent out in the early universe and they make a ripple here. And, and so the effect of this is you should count slightly more galaxies along this ring. And you know the radius of this ring is 500 light years. So it allows you to tell very accurately the distance to this galaxy because you measure the size of this ring, the angular size tells you how far away it is. It's like having a distance estimate to a supernova. And so there's a big project at Princeton to measure this. And this is one of the ways that we're going to try to measure the acceleration of the universe. And another one is using this cosmic web, as he said. I found that the universe was a sponge-like geometry as a cosmic web. Here's the, here's the Sloan Great Wall over here that he talked to going through here. But it's a sponge-like uh, web with... with um, uh, uh, clusters of galaxies connected by filaments and voids connected by tunnels. And so you can count these number of, of donut holes in the, in the, in the sponge. And, and uh, this is an example of this. And this is the, the jagged line here, are the observations. 
uh, and the, the dashed line are some simulations that we did that also use a cosmological constant equal to a constant. And there are no free-fitting parameters in this, so the fact that the amplitude of this curve matches rather exactly shows you that we're indistinguishably different from that simple cosmological constant term. But we're hoping in the next decade to measure these things with about 10 times or more accuracy and discover whether or not this we're rolling down a hill or whether we're just sitting at the bottom of a valley. So why are we so interested in this? Well, there's a third model out there called phantom energy. And these people say that the kinetic energy in this field is actually negative, And so you actually would be rolling up the hill. And, and this produces the foul. I think this is rather unphysical. Uh, you should roll down a hill. <laughs> be, be, be my take on it. But uh, they say, well, physics, we don't understand this. Uh, maybe they could be rolling up the hill. If you're rolling up the hill, something very bad happens. You, as you roll up the hill, the vacuum energy density gets bigger and bigger, and you start rolling faster and faster up the hill. And the, the repulsive gravitational effects of this get worse and worse. And eventually, about 20 billion years from now, it starts tearing up the galaxies. And then it tears up the solar systems. And then it tears up the stars. And then it tears up the planets. And then it tears up you. And it tears up your atoms, and it tears up the nuclei of your atoms. And there's called a big rip singularity. It rips everything apart. So if little w is seen to be more negative than minus 1, if it's minus 1.1 or something, that's very bad. <laughs> Because that means the universe is going to end in a big rip uh, about 20 billion years from now. If it's exactly equal to minus one, here's what's going to happen. It's just going to keep doubling and doubling and doubling in size forever. And we're sitting at the bottom of a valley, but eventually, a very long time from now, I'm talking about 10 to the 10 to the 50 years from now, it'll tunnel out of that valley into a lower state and it'll make a bubble universe with a lower density vacuum in it. And the laws of physics in this new bubble universe will be different than ours. It'll kill you. <laughs> you know, you don't want to be, you don't want to suddenly find an expanding bubble over here and it, it's going nearly at the speed of light and it encompasses you and you find out that all laws of physics are different, your DNA will blow up, you know. So, so um, we'll see another bubble, but other bubble universes will form and that'll, that, that process will continue. If W is less negative than minus one, it's like 0.99 or something, it means it's slowly rolling down a hill, and, and eventually this doubling and doubling in size of the universe will slow down, and it'll just end up expanding linearly. And, and, and we'll, we'll go on forever that way. It's a sort of more, more mild end. So this is one of the most important questions in, in cosmology today, measuring little w. We're trying to see what the exact properties of the dark energy is, because that's going to determine the ultimate uh, fate of, of the universe in the future. So we're, we're hoping to make these measurements, and in the next decade, that's the exciting prospect that we have to do. Okay. Thank you. Sure. <laughs> you have a question? <laughs> Anybody have a question? <laughs> There should be some question. Uh, rumor has it that Jensen Wilson called somebody at Princeton to figure out what this uh, five degree Kelvin was. Was that you? No, no, no. I worked with them. I worked with Penzis and Wilson as a graduate student. I ran their uh, telescope. This was this was after they'd made their discovery, but before they got the 
the Nobel Prize. But uh, uh, Penzis and Wilson had been measuring the, the background because they were doing a satellite experiment. And they they were, didn't like noise. So they found this, uh, here they were looking at the sky. They expected to get zero temperature. And they got about three degrees. It was above zero, this temperature. They, they were getting some microwaves in their antenna. Okay, and so they could compare this with a with a with a five degree or four degree liquid helium. Uh, uh, they could look at liquid helium and tell what its temperature was, and the, this was not low enough. This was not zero. Most people would have just said, "Ah, it must be some interference or something." They just gone on, but they said, "No, no, this is serious. So wh wh what's this difference?" You know, and so they 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 cleaned their 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 antenna out of the pigeon droppings which are 300 degrees, so a little bit of those would go a long way. No, that didn't make any difference. They did everything they could. They looked all over the sky. It was always the same. And so Pences called up his friend Bernie Burke, who was a radio astronomer, and he said, do you know of any astronomical thing that this, we're getting microwaves at two, three degrees could be? He said, oh my goodness, uh, Jim Peoples from Princeton, has been given talks on this. He and Dickey are there looking for this stuff because it's, it's predicted from the Big Bang. It's the hot radiation left over from the Big Bang. He'd been given talks on this. Dickey was a great maker of uh, radio receivers. In fact, Penzias and Wilson were using a Dickey switch, you know, to, in their thing. And, and Dickey thought he had a monopoly on this, you know. And so he's, he's, making a telescope to look for this at Princeton, and they beat him to the punch. And so they called him up, they called him up and said, we've detected this um, uh, three degrees uh, radiation here. And um, D Dickie said, well, we've been beat, boys. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Pulp stocks and things are in the room. Well, we've been scooped. So he drove, they drove out to Bell Labs, which is only 35 miles away, and found, to their amazement there, the only other radio telescope in the world capable of detecting this stuff. Gaumau predicted it, but didn't think it was possible to detect, you know? So it was just really challenging, you know? So, but they predicted it, and so then Gaumau wrote, wrote a letter to Penzias, and said, hey, you know, I predicted this earlier than Dickey, you know, <laughs> and so forth. So it all got straightened out in the end. But Mr. Gamma didn't live long enough to, to get the Nobel Prize and so forth, but he should have probably shared in that Nobel Prize, too. I think she has a question. Yeah. yeah. What's X, Y, and Z? X, Y, and Z are the three directions in space. So when we make a coordinate system, we say, well, here's X. That's this way, and then here's Y, that's that way, and Z was always up, you know. So it's the three directions of space. And then there's one direction at a time. So if I want to tell you where to go to this meeting, I could tell you the, the latitude and longitude to go. I could tell you the, the, the height to go. I mean, you don't want to be up on the roof, you'd miss my time. But I also have to tell you what time to come. I have to tell you to come at 8.30, otherwise you won't, won't see the talk. So there, there are four coordinates that you really have to tell someone where to go to see an event. And that's three coordinates of space, which we call X, Y, and Z. And then there's the coordinate of time, which we call T. So those are just the names for the three dimensions of space and the, and the one dimension of time. And so. Einstein showed that you could really look at time as a dimension, as a, as a, like the other dimensions. Changed our idea of what time was. Okay. Well, these bubble universes that'll happen later, uh, if you lived in one of those, it would look to you like a Big Bang. So our, our universe is already expanding. This, this dark energy is expanding faster and faster and faster. And if a bubble of new lower density vacuum comes in, it, that bubble will expand at the speed of light and the, uh, it could form other stuff inside of it. It's, it's, it's born expanding. So, so the, the, um, 
uh, you, you can have other universes later, uh, you know, whether they'll be interesting or not, or have intelligent creatures in them or not, that's not clear. But, you know, we, we, we think we're one of the universes that formed from an original inflating sea, like we're one bubble in an inflating sea, uh, and so there can be other bubbles that form in the future, particularly if it stays in this low valley and has to tunnel out. That would make a bubble. So there, there could be more in the future. Um, if you're just rolling down the hill, Mr. Linde would say, there's always a chance that a quantum fluctuation will send you back up on the hill. And then you'll, you'll, you'll roll back down again. So in, in both of these models, there's a, there's a possibility for having universes in the future occur. They're very unlikely, and so you have to wait for them a long time to see them. But eventually, they'd be there. In the back. Ten to the minus thirty-eight seconds, roughly. Ten to the minus thirty-eight seconds. Tiny. What's the speed now? Well, um, the 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 expansion of the when you say what's the speed of expansion, today the universe has gotten to be very big. We think that it started. Uh, 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 very tiny, and it's exploded by a large size since then. The universe is enormous today. It's the, the part that we can see is, 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 has a radius of 13.7 of, of billion light years, and, and in inflation, we expect the, the actual universe to be much larger than that. We just can't see it all. So, so uh, um, our universe has grown enormously in size, and uh, the parts beyond our visible horizon are simply expanding away from us so fast that we can't see them. The light, the light has not had time to get to us from them. And if it, it, oh yes, yes, yes. Yeah. Well, it's like it's like you're a dime sitting on a balloon, and the balloon is expanding. And the balloon gets bigger, and the other dimes are moving away from you, and the whole universe is expanding very fast. Imagine the balloon is doubling in size. It, right now, it's doubling in size about once every 10 billion years. So the, 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 the very distant places from us are, are getting sort of twice as far away every 10 billion years. So um, you, as a dime, though, sitting scotch tape to the balloon, you just think you're at rest, and the other ones are fleeing from you, so you don't notice anything. Okay. So eventually, someday in the very far future, our ancestors, as everything expands further and further and further away, we'll only realize that we're like, have one galaxy, we won't be able to see everything, that there's a universe anymore. Yeah, that's, that's been pointed out by Mr. Krauss. Um, the, the other galaxies that we see today, uh, distant galaxies, um, as the universe is accelerating in expansion, their velocity away from us is increasing. And so we see them increasing and increasing and increasing in speed. It looks like they're going faster and faster toward the velocity of light. Their photons we're getting from them are being more and more red shifted. It looks kind of like they're falling into a black hole. And so after a while, we don't see events on those galaxies anymore. So they're giving us a newscast and they say, things are going great here. And so what we hear, the way we hear that, when the light signals are coming, things are go. We never hear they're going great now. Those, those photons are forever on their way to us, and it's expanding further away. Because now it's going, it's keep doubling in size, and then that's beating the speed of light. The, the space between us and them is stretching faster than the speed of light. So we don't, 
we don't hear anything more from those galaxies, any new information. We can still see them going away from us, you know, at nearly the speed of light. We're looking back in the past. But we don't see any new current news from them anymore. And so this is, this is um, and, and of course, everything that's going to fall together gravitationally, like the local group, it's going to, Andromeda is going to come, it's going to collide with us, we're going to make one big galaxy. But the distance galaxies will flee. So eventually we're kind of living in one galaxy in a pretty empty universe. If we don't look carefully, we, we may not see the other galaxies. And, and, and you can be fooled into thinking you were alone in a, in a universe. But, but you'll still have the element abundances of helium and deuterium and things that will show you that you had a big bang. You'll see, still see the cosmic microwave background, albeit very faintly. And so uh, uh, in the trillion years from now, if this expansion goes on, the future astronomers will find it much more challenging. And they won't be seeing any new stuff. Whereas if the, the expansion rate slows down, we'll start to see new stuff. We'll see more new stuff. And we'll see some new galaxies that we can't yet see now because light's had time to travel from us to them. So, so we get a much grander view, if you will, of the universe in the future if we're really rolling down a hill to zero. So we, we, will, we will see. So either, either the, the, the new observations will show us coning in on minus one, minus one, minus one more and more accurately. And then at some point we'll say, ah, you know, it's just minus one. <laughs> but if we just see a detectable difference, then we can say, oh, it's slowly rolling down a hill. Or, oh, it's slowly rolling up a hill. Uh-oh. <laughs> or, oh, it's slowly rolling down a hill. Well, now we know that that's like inflation in the, in the early universe. So we think that r slowly rolling down a hill is a conservative alternative because it's something we've seen before. And you think it will know that? Well, that's the hope of the decadal report. They say that's what we should be putting our primary effort into. But of course, it depends on how close that W is to minus one. It could be very close, in which case you won't find out without doing a lot more observations. It could be, you know, so it, it's, it's, um, it's sort of, well, where are you going to call the game off? If it's, right now, it's, it's close to minus one but with about 10% accuracy. But we like to get that down to 1% or maybe a half a percent. And then if we don't see anything, we'll say, uh, a crucial guideline is we've had about 60, uh, well, it's more like 90 doubling times uh, in inflation in the early universe at least. And if the current dark energy has 90 doubling times in the future. So 90, if, if this goes on for 90 times 10 to the billion, 10 to the, 90 times 10 billion years or 900 billion years in the future, it continues expanding exponentially, then uh, this value of little w would be about 0.4%. So, so that's a number that we can look for. If we see, if it's less than 0.4%, we probably give up on it and say, well, it's pretty much minus one. But if it's bigger than that, we should be able to see it, and they're hot after the track of looking for it, because, okay. Do you have one message to give to a group of young Boy Scouts who are here to see you tonight instead of playing manhunt in the field? And I know there has to be that question. Well, why is this important in, in their lifetimes to understand what it is that you've said? Well, I think astronomy is important for us to understand our place in the universe. You know, we're proud to say that we now think we know what the stuff of the universe is made of, the three different kinds of stuff there. I mean, imagine how embarrassed we are not to, not to know about 70% of this. So I think that the, the, um, um, one of the great accomplishments that the human race has made in its history is to, if we were telling extraterrestrials what we'd done, we'd probably show them that equation that Einstein wrote, you know? And, and, and we'd say, well, look, one of our people thought of this equation here. We understand, we figured out, you know, how the universe got its beginning. We should be pretty, pretty proud of that. And, and um, uh, you know, Einstein also, when he did special relativity, 
It was all about learning and understanding the laws of physics. And, 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 and one of the theorems that he got out of special relativity was E equals mc squared, which ended up with the atomic bomb and nuclear power plants and things. So uh, it's hard to say what the practical import would be, but Einstein certainly had a practical import on the 20th century. But I think it's just important to understand what we are and, and, and where we're going. And, and to, to Boy Scouts today, I'd, I'd like to say, on a completely different topic, I'd like to say, think about trying to go to Mars. <laughs> because I grew up and I went, to, uh, you got Buzz Aldrin there in the back as inspiration. Uh, he came here, he signed your, he gave you a flag that had been to the moon. Um, I went to see Buzz Aldrin take off for the moon. And at the time, I was standing there watching the Apollo 11 take off and go to the moon. Um, we thought that people would be on Mars by 1985. Von Braun had plans to send people to Mars by 1985. And it's an embarrassment that we haven't done it yet. I mean, you've maybe seen the movie 2001. Wonderful Stanley Kubrick movie. What were we doing in that movie in 2001? He did this in the 60s, he did this movie. 2001, we were sending people to Jupiter for goodness sakes. Mars was easy, we'd been there of course. You know, so, you know, we also had flying cars, I'm sure, you know, you've seen the Back to the Future movie. Um, you know, we're, we're, we've fallen short of what we should have done by now, which is go to Mars. It's important to find some people that want to colonize Mars and live there and, and give, give us a life insurance policy in case something bad goes on here on the Earth. Go look at the Tyrannosaurus in the museum. It's smiling at you, you know. It was the biggest thing there. It had six inch teeth. Everything was afraid of it. It's gone now. Only lasted two and a half million years. Asteroid got it. So we should be planting a colony somewhere else and, 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 and expanding human civilization. Because if I were talking to extraterrestrials, another thing I'd tell them is, I'd say, you know, we've been to the moon. We got to the moon. That's an accomplishment. So I'd like to see us go to Mars. And some of you people are the right age to do it. But I hope somebody gets the wherewithal to, to, to actually do it. Okay. Uh, back to uh, Professor uh, Lauren Krauss, you mentioned in his book, I think, The Universal Nothing, he mentioned that um, the, energy, the mass energy of empty space, let's say you take, um, you take a neutron, right? And uh, let's say you measure it, its mass, right? And then you subtract the mass of quarks, right? The stuff that. Okay, <laughs> yeah. Now, This is completely different, I, I would say. I mean, the, 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 the density in the early universe is very high. This is very high. This is higher than your, you, you know, um, uh, uh, this is uh, uh, an extraordinarily high density. Um, it's, it's an extraordinarily high negative pressure. And so uh, this, is a, this is what we call a, a, a vacuum state in the, in the in the proton, you've got your, your quarks there and they're bound with, with gluons and you have to consider the binding energy of it and the, the, the naked uh, uh, masses of the quarks and so forth. And it, so it's fairly complicated. But this is a bit of a different phenomenon going on. This is a vacuum energy due to the fact that uh, we have some field permeating space. And we recently discovered the Higgs particle, which is associated with a field called the Higgs field, that gives particles their mass. And so uh, uh, there's a Higgs field permeating space, giving the particles their mass. And so the Higgs particle is associated with that. And there was this Nobel Prize given for that, for Mr. Higgs points to this. But now we've got, we've got so many evidences in, in favor of inflation now, it's, it's, it's really um, 
um, really convincing case, I think. It was convincing before this gravity wave stuff, but this is really, if that proves out to be correct, it's really a smoking gun showing that you had inflation in the early universe. And it explains uh, uh, how the universe is so uniform, how the different parts of it got in communication early on to get to the same temperature, and it explains why the universe is so enormous, because you had many, that doubling thing, if, if that just goes on for 10 doublings, you've, you've increased by a factor of 1,000. If it goes on for uh, another 10 doublings, it's a, it's a factor of a million. If it goes on to another 10 doublings, it's a factor of a billion. So you can get very large universes this way, out of very tiny things. So it's, it's making the universe out of a little, little tiny bit of stuff. Well, no, there isn't really a center. I think the, the analogy here that speaks very well to this is, is scotch taping dimes onto a balloon. Now, you pick one of the dimes. That's you. Blow up the balloon. All your other friends, the other dimes, are moving away from you. It looks uniformly. You're at the center. You're not moving. All the other dimes are getting further away from you. Um, as you, according to you, really what's happening is the space between the dimes is expanding. That's what's happening. It's a rubber. It's expanding. The space between the dimes. So any, now pick another dime over there. Not me, but, but another galaxy over there. Another dime. We'll rotate the thing. It thinks it's in the center. And the other dimes are moving away from it. So, so when, we, when we, these are called the uniform homogeneous models of general relativity where, where Einstein's model was every place in the universe was, was uh, kind of the same. There was no center. There were, it was all like, just like everybody can say, well, I'm at the center of the world. I'm here. I'm standing on top. Those people in Australia are hanging off the bottom, you know. They must be upside down, you know. I went to Australia once and I looked up at the moon and I said, Gosh, I swear that was a first quarter moon yesterday, and now it's the last quarter moon. What? Did I, did I forget? Oh, I'm upside down. I'm upside down. <laughs> constellations are, you got to look backwards to see the constellations down there. But you think you're on top. So it's like that, you know. You think, you, you can think you're at the center and you're at rest. There is no you know, uniform standard rest. So, you know, you, th you can think you're in the, in the center. So, yeah, yeah, no place is special yeah. in that sense. Okay. Well, I think we, we know the other galaxies are moving away from us because we can see they got a velocity away from us. Their, their, their spectral lines are red shifted by the Doppler effect, and so we know they're moving away from us. But your observation is based on where you can. Right? Sure, sure. Well, if I was on that galaxy, if I was on that galaxy, I'd look back at our galaxy and say the Milky Way is moving away from us. We're at rest. It is, motions are relative in this thing. But, but, but what we can say is about the relative motions of these. Let's put it this way. You're looking at something. You're looking at galaxies. You're observing. They're moving away from each other. But you are on a spiral course. And the time frame that it takes for you to get from point A to B through view to observe the Well. Well, we got some evidence that the universe isn't rotating, that we're not on a spiral course, because that microwave background radiation would have, would, would be, have a different temperature along the equator as along the poles of this rotation. We don't see that effect. 
So we have some evidence that the universe is expanding but not rotating. And the galaxies have angular momentum that are all in random directions. Kurt Gerdel had a rotating universe model where, where, things, where, where things were rotating. But, but that model um, uh, would have predicted all the galaxies' rotation axes would be lined up, and that's not observed. And the microwave background wouldn't have worked the same. So, I mean, we have some, some evidence in favor of this standard expanding but not rotating model that, and, and we see when we count galaxies in different directions, and we look at this microwave background, it's very homogeneous, you know. I mean, the different spots in the sky look very similar. So, so we, we got some evidence that the universe is homogeneous on large scales from the observations, and these homogeneous models behave this way. They expand homogeneously by the equations of general relativity. Well, we've been getting, we first noticed uh, galaxies are moving away from us in about 1917. And we're, we're, again, by looking back, we're measuring the acceleration of this, and we're seeing that they're moving a, a little bit faster. So, so I don't think that they're going to be radically uh, changing. You know, it, it, we're getting a snapshot, really, of the universe, and they're, they're moving away from us. So it's expanding right now. When we look back in the past, we're looking billions of years ago at, at quasars and things, and we see them moving away from us. We plot them on this line, and so we can tell that the universe has been expanding for a long time. So we don't, we're getting a picture of its expansion over time, and it's all fitting in with this very simple model. If it didn't, uh, if there were something troubling about that model, uh, it, it would be turning up. Okay. Yes, it's one of the few galaxies that's moving toward us. And, and that's because of gravity, normal Einsteinian, Newtonian gravity. It's close to us. And so it started expanding away from us in the early Big Bang. But because we're denser than average in the universe, that we're one of these positive density fluctuations in the universe, um, it slowed down. And now it's coming back from us, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to collide with us about maybe four billion or so years from now. So, so this, is, this will eventually make one galaxy. But the other ones that are further away and still moving away from us, there's only a handful of galaxies that are moving toward us. And, and these are ones that can be gravitationally bound to us. Gravity's pulling them backwards. So the conclusion of your talk was that you were going to test the theory over the next decade by improving the accuracy of your observations by at least a factor of 10, you're saying. Yes. So I may not have followed your lecture as well as everyone else here did. So when you get results of your yes. test, how will I recognize that when it's in the New York Times? Will it have a headline saying, W is less than minus one? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes, yes. It'll say phantom energy. The universe is going to die in 20 billion years. I think it'll be... If it's a phantom energy, it'll get a very dramatic headline. Uh, I, I think you, you, you'll, uh, when they, if it's minus one, there'll be a headline saying, Einstein was right after all. That's what the headline will say. And if it's rolling down the hill, it'll say, you know, Linda is right, or it's saying, you know, a, 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 um, a uh, die with a whimper kind of universe is ahead of us, you know. Uh, you know. Uh, I think the the um, uh, that's the way the headline will read, um, uh, you know, and and it's a headline producing event because if we if we discover this this dark energy is really rolling down the hill, it means that it's like the stuff early on, and and we're really testing the laws of physics in extreme ways here, you know. So we'll, we'll learn something new about the laws of physics if it's rolling down the hill. If it's minus one, we'll, we'll learn that we're at the, maybe at the bottom of a, a valley, sitting at the bottom of a valley. So I, I think these are, these are things that we, we can uh, learn, and there'll be, there'll be a headline to propose that. And,
Keep your eyes out 10, 15 years from now. I've heard the term used before that the, that the universe is flat, but we're always talking about you know, the expansion taking place. So I'm a little confused with that. Like how, how can some people say... Okay, what, here's what flat means. It's the geometry of one slice through space-time at the present epoch. So if you imagine that everybody had an alarm clock that started at the Big Bang, and those alarm clocks all rang 13.7 billion years after the Big Bang. Oh, here's our alarm clock going off. Here's these other alarm clocks. Going. What's the geometry of this space-like slice where all the alarm clocks go off? And according to what we've measured from the cosmic microwave background, from the position of that peak there of how big the dots were, how big the spots were on that, we could tell that the geometry we're looking at looks flat. That means it obeys Euclidean geometry. It's like the solid geometry that you learned in high school, you know. Triangles have 180 degrees in them. You know, it, it's, the, it's the standard sort of uh, Euclidean geometry for that slice. Now, it's fair to say that uh, we're only observing a very small part of the universe. So if I, if I pointed at this floor and I said, you know, this floor is flat. Let's measure the triangles. Look, it's approximately flat. Actually, though, it's part of the surface of the Earth, which is curved and is positively curved. It's like the surface of a sphere. But if I only measure out 13.7 billion light years, which is like looking at a circle on a basketball court, you know, it, it could look approximately flat. But if, uh, Alan Guth was happy with this with inflation. He said, you know, it doesn't matter what shape the universe is. It could look like an elephant. A big enough elephant looks flat. The tusk, blow up the tusk of an elephant by a trillion times, it looks like a giant flat plane, you know, the, the part you can see looks pretty flat. So the universe expands, it doesn't matter what shape it was in, inflation will, will straighten out all those curvature and, and it'll be really, really big. So really, really big you know, Mickey Mouse balloon, locally it looks like a flat sheet of rubber. If you, if you blow it up enough, blow it up a trillion times, blow it up a trillion trillion times, you know, it's, it, it, it's very flat. So, so that's why we think it looks flat, is inflation's responsible. The universe has gotten very, very big. So all we can really say is the universe is relatively flat over the part we can see, which is thir radius of 13.7 billion light years. And in other words, the universe is much bigger than that. Um, Bye. -bye. Yes. Last, last question, maybe right here. Oh, okay. Oh, um, I've heard people talking about the universe ending in the heat death. Is that the same as the big rip? Or in which value of the universe? That's a little bit, that's a little bit different. The, the, the heat death is, is uh, due to the following. Um, the heat death occurs in the W equals minus one case. Exactly. Uh, here's what happens. The universe keeps doubling, doubling in size. And so the galaxies are fleeing to us, and as I said to you, you're going to start losing track of them. The, the new newscasts are not going to get to you. So there's some events in the space-time that you can't see. It's like they've fallen behind a black hole, inside a black hole. So you're, you're, you're hearing this other galaxy, is telling, things are going fine, but you hear things are going, you know, you never hear the last of it. That means there's an event horizon in your universe, there's events that you can't see, just like in the black hole case. So Stephen Hawking showed that the, the universe, that, that, that a black hole emits thermal radiation because of this event horizon. And it, it causes the black hole to eventually evaporate. This is his most famous discovery. Well, the same thing's true in these universe models. He did a paper with Mr. Gibbons that showed the same effect shows up in these inflating universe models. And so, if we end up in the W equal minus one case, um, these things are gonna disappear from us and we're gonna start to see some very low temperature thermal radiation. We're talking 10 to minus 31 degrees um, above zero. Not three degrees, but 10 to minus 31 degrees. Very low temperature radiation. Radiation with a wavelength of about 10 billion light years, okay? 
very low energy thermal radiation. But in the normal universe, if you have this uh, expansion that slows down, like the, the, the rolling down a hill, then um, eventually the temperature of the universe is going to go to zero. And that's good for us. Because we can always, if we got finite energy reserves, we can operate at lower and lower temperatures, Freeman Dyson showed. And so we can dump our waste heat into the thermal into the cosmic microwave background, which is getting colder and colder and colder. So if I wanted to give the same talk as I'm giving now, but use half the energy, I would send photons out with half the energy, and the talk would take twice as long. We'd all have to wait here twice as long. So I could pre speak twice as slowly and operate at 150 degrees instead of 300 degrees, and everything would be cooler and take place slower, and I would use half the energy. So I could make a finite amount of energy that we got in our galaxy last forever in this model. But if you got this W equal minus one case, this thermal radiation is going to come in at a constant temperature and eventually it's going to kill your intelligent life because you won't be able to, you'll run out of energy. You have to keep operating above that temperature and it takes a finite amount of energy and you run out of energy. You can't operate colder and colder and slower and slower. So uh, it, that case is actually in the far future not as good for us as the other. But, you know, first we've got to get past the first million years, you know. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Just if you would, um, thank you for the question. Thank you, Dr. Gott. Okay. Before um, everybody gets up and ramps out and, and, and goes along to business, I just wanted to personally thank you. My name is Jim Rosselli, I'm the president of the New Jersey Astronomical Association. I am pleased to see everybody here. Keeping up with the universe and distance, I'm going to stay back here because I'm monitoring the webcasting. But I do want to let everybody know that this is a volunteer organization. All the people that run this organization volunteered their time, their spirit, their knowledge, their energy. Essentially, we need your help all the time. If you would please consider, there's a donation box in the back. Make a small contribution to us so we can continue to do this, so we can continue to fund the organization and have these remarkable speakers like Dr. Gott be here on a continuing basis. Thank you very much. Please, orderly, I know we're going to do a bunch of things, but thank you, Dr. Well, first, okay. thank you. This is New Jersey, and unfortunately, there's cloud cover. So the scopes are ready, but we can't see through the clouds because we don't have a radio telescope. Um, so